6 and 2012, he was president of the American Association of University Professors. One of the main functions of this job is uh, to protect academic freedom of American faculty members. In this position, he severely criticized the many attempts uh, to boycott Israeli scholars, uh, scholars and, and universities, uh, and, um, and authored, co-authored a book uh, about the issue, the case against academic um, boycott of Israel. He noticed uh, much ignorance and manipulations among scholars debating resolutions for the boycott in many American and international scholarly associations. He wrote the book, uh, Dreams Deferred, a concise guide to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the movement to boycott Israel. Uh, just a year ago, in 2019, he published um, Israel Denial, Anti-Zionism, Anti-Semitism, and the Faculty Campaign Against the Jewish State. Since one of the main arguments of those who call for academic boycott of Israel is alleged Israeli violations of academic freedom in the territory ruled by exclusively by the Palestinian Authority. He decides to investigate how the Palestinians protect academic freedom in their own universities. Uh, he reports his findings in a new book uh, just released titled, Not in Kansas Anymore, Academic Freedom in Palestinian Universities. This is also the topic he will be talking today uh, for, to, uh, to us. And uh, uh, we will have, uh, we will, uh, Professor Nelson will talk to us for about, I don't know, 40 minutes, just a lecture, and then we will have a QA. and a uh, Please uh, uh, use the chat function uh, to ask your questions. Professor Nelson, please. Professor Nelson? Well, Professor Nelson is not with us apparently. He will shortly uh, uh, connect with us. I guess there yeah. isn't much academic freedom. What, Hillel? What did you say? There isn't probably much um, Palestinian academic freedom, so he didn't. He had very little to say. Well, no, no. <laughs> he wrote a whole book about it, so <laughs> there must be something that uh, he found to say. Uh, we're still waiting for him. Uh, let me see. We'll wait one more minute. This happens when you... Okay, Professor Nelson, are you with us? Professor Nelson? Sorry about that. Okay, you disappeared. Did you hear my introduction? Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, don't worry about it. Just begin your talk, please. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank thank um, Professor Gilboa and the Basis Center for giving me this opportunity. I have read scores and scores of base of public base of publications over the years, um, and so I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to contribute um, to the dialogue that BESA has been sponsoring uh, for so long and, and so ambitiously. I, I should begin by saying, I think, that the claim that Israel suppresses Palestinian academic freedom remains one of the most effective ways of weaponizing faculty members in the United States and Europe. It's the thing that strikes at the heart of their belief system. If they can be convinced that Israel is a danger uh, to academic freedom, then they feel that the most fundamental values of the university have been compromised. And so it's less effective with students who don't know what academic freedom is and probably don't much care, but it is a very powerful weapon used against faculty members. Uh, this, the, this particular project 
about Palestinian academic freedom began uh, with a 2015 essay in the journal Telos. I revisited it and revised it again uh, in my 2019 book, Israel Denial, where it became a 10,000 word chapter. <clears throat> then Miriam Elman of the Academic Engagement Network suggested that it might be worth revisiting again in search of still more evidence, especially about the status of West Bank academic freedom. I'm not sure anyone expected that there was a lot of academic freedom in Gaza anyway, but at least on the West Bank, more evidence might be able to be found. And so it's now become a 50,000 word, <coughs> word book. <coughs> it's grown quite a bit. My aim in revising and expanding it was twofold. First, to move from what was merely a representative account of you know, representative examples to as much as possible a comprehensive account of academic freedom in Gaza and the West Bank. And second, I wanted to cover the history of Palestinian higher education, as well as the collateral issues, because academic freedom in both Gaza and the West Bank really has much more dy dynamic and causative relationships with other elements of Palestinian society. The most obvious example is freedom of the press. If you don't really have freedom of the press, you're not gonna have academic freedom. Now in Israel and the United States, one often doesn't think of that because uh, those, those values aren't in crisis. So I point out all of this out in part because at the end, I wanna say a little bit about the difficulties of doing this kind of research and the kind of labyrinthine quality that it has. There's no easy way to get to the information that you need. So uh, let me begin with what is the basic paradox about Palestinian higher education, that the, um, the, most, the single most relevant statement that you can make. So I think it is true that Palestinian universities are perfectly capable of preparing a student to be, say, a competent accountant or a medical technician. Training in these and other practical careers that are obviously necessary to the functioning of Palestinian society apparently proceeds reliably. They do that. They, they produce the people with that kind of competence. Palestinian universities have not yet evolved into full-fledged PhD granting institutions I don't know that there's any prospect that they will, in fact, but they've added a number of master's degree programs over the last generation. Their record of encouraging faculty research, long acknowledged to be extremely weak, has also improved over the last 20 years. But there's still a lot of faculty pub publishing in uh, local venues that are not peer reviewed or not peer reviewed in any kind of meaningful way, but at least they're writing more than they did a generation ago. But Palestinian universities also have an ideological mission, indoctrination in remorseless anti-Zionism. In some cases, most commonly in the humanities and social sciences, anti-Zionism is integral to West Bank and Gazan higher education pedagogy and the curriculum. It's, it's structured, it's built in, it's an inescapable component. A similar though much less extreme phenomenon of course obtains in, obtains in humanities and social science programs in the West. We're familiar with that, but a more relentless and pervasive form of coercive indoctrination, one in which campus as a whole really are anti-Zionist learning environment. It's not just the classroom. It's not just the curriculum. It's everything that happens on the campus. All of the public interactions, many of them, have that kind of function as an anti-Zionist learning environment. And there are a few campuses in the US where people would like to make that happen, but it can't, it hasn't happened. And I don't think it really can. Both in the classroom and in other settings, Palestinian anti-Zionism clearly crosses a line into anti-Semitism. And I don't see how this really can be debated. I'll give some of the evidence for it, but 
it seems to me incontrovertible. Studies of elementary and secondary Palestinian textbooks have long dominated that pattern and Israelis and, El and Israel's allies throughout the world have often, and they continue to complain about those textbooks. I think in some ways, there is an arguably still more serious problem in higher education about anti-Zionist pedagogy for one obvious reason. Young adults are a little more capable than young children are of acting on what they have learned. They're being prepared for their adult careers and therefore uh, anti-Semitism has much greater purchase on Palestinian culture when it's instilled in people who are 17, 18, 20 years old. Now it's fundamental and axiomatic on the international left. It's a kind of article of faith that the state of Israel comprehensively suppresses the academic freedom of Palestinian students and faculty. My new book, Not in Kansas Anymore, Academic Freedom in Palestinian Universities, sets out for the first time to ask what evidence could support that claim about Israel, determine whether or not it's true. And the evidence that I've gathered confirms that Palestinian students and faculty, in fact, do not have the protections they need to exercise either freedom of speech or academic freedom. Indeed, they are threatened and coerced, really coerced to conform. It's simply not Israelis who do so. Perhaps surprisingly, the left-wing orthodoxy about Palestinian academic freedom has no real body of opposing arguments. Zionist discourse is substantively silent on the matter, routinely rejecting the anti-Zionist assertions, but offering inadequate counter evidence. It's, it's a debate in which the Zionist component is weak and unsupported. While proving a negative that Israelis don't substantially suppress academic freedom, may at first seem difficult, inquiry can begin by assessing, assessing the state of academic freedom on Palestinian campuses and then investigating who is historically and currently responsible for that state of affairs. <clears throat> and it really needs to be not just a contemporary analysis, but an historical analysis over uh, the last 50 years. A, a telling anecdote may offer a place to begin. From 1978 to 1991, Professor Sare Niseba taught philosophy at Birzeit University on the West Bank. He'd studied at Oxford and received a doctorate in Islamic philosophy later from Harvard. In September 1987, at the end of a lecture on John Locke, he learned that a group of masked men armed with clubs were outside his classroom seeking a traitor whom he shortly learned was himself. Didn't initially dawn on him that he could be the object of those chants, but in fact he was. Keeping his faculty colleagues at bay with knives so they couldn't come to his assistance, they beat him with fists, clubs, a broken bottle, and pen knives. Nesaba realized quickly that the intent <coughs> was not just to deliver a beating, but to kill him. So he ran into an elevator, pressed the button, and the elevator wasn't working. The students who were attacking him crowded into the elevator with him, and then he was, in effect, surrounded and blocked. Thanks to adrenaline, and because that gave, he wasn't really surrounded, he was just you know, the, ele the elevator was physically behind him. The students were in front of him. He hurled himself against the students, broke through the crowd, and ran. As he writes in his autobiographical Once Upon a Country, my heart was pounding hard enough to pop my eardrums. His colleagues were then free to help him because he was outside the crowd. They drove him to the hospital where his forehead wound was stitched up, <clears throat> and his broken arm was set. Afterwards, 
he learned that his attackers, they all had ski masks, were students at Bear Sight. Worse still, he learned that he knew a couple of the student attackers quite well. They'd been in his own classes and they turned to an effort to kill him. The reaction of the university was indifferent. It only issued a general statement condemning campus violence and not referring to the attack on Maseba. The faculty union, ordinarily a support for faculty members, refused to support him. They would not uh, issue a statement uh, at all. Now, the Fatah, Fatah organization couldn't figure out what to do. Um, so they uh, put out two statements, one defending him and one suggesting that he really had a good beating coming to him. <laughs> so they worked both sides of the fence. He'd been identified as a traitor for participating in discussions of Israeli-Palestinian possibilities for peace. He had met with Israelis to talk about the peace process. And what's particularly notable is that Arafat had approved uh, Nuseba doing so. Um, Arafat was informed regularly of the negotiations that Nuseba was involved in, no matter. The campus, Bir Zayt, was riven by rival political groups with multiple student paramilitary cadres available to impose their competing views by force. So Fatah is divided and the campus is just structured by what are effectively student paramilitary organizations and they intimidate people and administer beatings to both faculties and students. Some years later, not many, <clears throat> Naseba became president of Al-Quds University in Jerusalem, a position which he held until 2014. Throughout that time, as president, he was entitled to something special. He was accompanied everywhere he went on campus by bodyguards. He continued to teach a class. His bodyguards stood outside the classroom and guarded the entrance while he taught. Unfortunately, most Palestinian faculty uh, don't get to have bodyguards accompanying them. His narrative is quite compelling in part because he wrote about it so forcefully, but it's not unique. Such incidents have a long history. In the 1980s, the head of Islamic University's Department of Arabic Language and Literatures, Dr. Ismail Al-Khatib, was gunned down by Fatah operatives killed in front of his house in the presence of his children. In 2005, Fatah gunmen assaulted Islamic University of Gaza president, uh, Adnan Al-Qadi in his office. As recently as 2014, An-Najjar University political scientist and Palestinian Authority opponent, uh, Abdul Sattar Qasim was shot in his car, but survived. He blamed the Palestinian Authority. I cite another number of other examples in the book of assaults on Palestinian faculty and administrators by Palestinians. It doesn't take hundreds of such cases to create a chilling environment for political speech. Um, these assaults all serve as a warning and they're not the only relevant assaults, assaults that do so. Uh, the long history of assassinating people accused of collaboration with Israel in both Gaza and the West Bank also produce warnings that bear on faculty willingness to speak honestly. Now, when higher education institutions worldwide carry the name college or university, we often assume that these institutions are roughly similar everywhere. It's true that an accounting or engineering course in one country will often resemble courses in the same subject elsewhere. But a religion course obviously in a theocracy that imposes a state religion will not be the same as that course with the same name in countries where religious and democratic freedoms prevail. A course on government or politics in a dictatorship will not resemble comparably named courses elsewhere. Cultural and political differences have instructional consequences. 
when the differences are substantial, they can produce quite different models of what constitutes higher education. It's important to remember in this context that there were no Palestinian universities prior to the 1967 war. <clears throat> Egypt neither permitted nor encouraged their development during the years when it occupied Gaza, nor did Jordan do so when it occupied the West Bank. Israel granted the permission for Palestinian universities early in the 1970s, which means that Palestinian higher education was founded and evolved during a period in which Palestinians were developing a sense of national identity and acquiring political aspirations. It's neither surprising nor necessarily objectionable that emerging educational university institutions played a role in articulating Palestinian identity and in its components aspirations. What no one could have anticipated was the role that <coughs> higher education played during the first intifada. Ido Zelkovitz's Students and Resistance in Palestine is a reliable guide to that history. <clears throat> in any case, Palestinian universities became organizing centers, both for the political arguments fueling the intifada and for off-campus demonstrations. In other words, demonstrations that occurred in city spaces were often organized by university students and faculty. Fearing a general insurrection, Israel repeatedly closed down campuses. Though that did not curtail the growing definitional commitment to a university mission of political resistance. Off-campus classes were officially prohibited, but in practice, Israel tolerated them. So those classes held off campus inevitably became sites of political discussion and debate. Palestinian higher education consequently acquired a really quite intense commitment to hostile political action. When the second intifada broke out, a number of students traded stones and Molotov cocktails for bombs. So the violence that began in the first intifada on campus and among students escalated specifically within that constituency <clears throat> during the second intifada. The pervasive politicization and militarization of education that took place in Palestinian universities in the 1980s has left a, le a legacy that is still relevant and influential today. We tend to assume that the principle of academic freedom, the principle that underlies higher education and governs its intellectual functions means the same thing from one country to another. Academic freedom is the right of faculty members to express their ideas freely and publish accordingly without fear of retribution. It also gives students the right to express their views freely and study within fields of their choosing. So there's a faculty and a student component of it. A number of countries around the world and their educational institutions claim to honor the principle of academic freedom. And sometimes that's true. But regarding the two most sensitive subjects, religion and politics, academic freedom is often claimed either falsely or actually disingenuously. It's always politics and religion where the test of academic freedom really arises. In a number of Palestinian institutions, and I conclude that academic freedom really does not exist at all. My book's title, Not in Kansas Anymore, which I borrow from Dorothy's famous remark to her dog Toto in The Wizard of Oz, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Toto, is intended to highlight that difference. It also signals the shock that follows upon recognizing the difference. Allying with a Hamas cell is not the same as joining a chapter of college Democrats or college Republicans on an American campus. Responsible international authorities conclude that academic freedom in Israel proper functions as it does in European countries and in the US and Canada. Uh, the, no responsible group disagrees with that. Lively and often heated debates about politics and religion 
the very topics prohibited largely on the West Bank, take place on Israeli campuses without fear of sanctions. Colleges and universities operate without state intervention in intellectual matters. Fear of violence does not govern daily life on an Israeli campus, or at least it doesn't since the installation of the security barrier. This isn't the case on the West Bank and Gaza. At Islamic University of Gaza, the entire curriculum is required, is required to be taught from a radical Islamist perspective. It's a requirement. Violent clashes between rival student political factions occur frequently. And the campus as a whole is dedicated to the service of the terrorist group Hamas. Faculty administrators and faculty members and administrators there and in the West Bank are, as I suggested earlier, sometimes threatened, and as in the case of Naseba's case, literally assaulted. IUG is not simply politicized, it's thoroughly militarized. At An Najah University in the West Bank of Nablus and at Birzai University near Ramallah, Hamas regularly wins the elections to control the powerful student government. But conflicts with Hamas's political rival Fatah are commonplace. During the Second Intifada, some students helped organize or actually participated in suicide and other bombings. Matthew Levitt is among those who list some of the An Najah students involved, including amongst dozens of others, Muhammad al Ghul, who blew himself up on a Jerusalem bus on June 18, 2002, killing 19 and wounding over 70, Assam Raihan, who attacked a bus near Emmanuel with a roadside bomb and automatic weapons, killing 10 and wounding students. These were these uh, wounding 30, these were students at Palestinian at the Palestinian University of Al Najah. And there are quite long lists of the people directly involved in suicide bombings or involved in the planning and carrying out of them. There are a whole list of activities to make the suicide bombing real. Uh, the, the, the areas have to be scouted, weapons have to be purchased, uh, studied, and so forth. So um, the number of students involved is even much larger than the dozens that I list in the book. One way or another, the campus environment at An Najah and other institutions for decades has helped prepare some current students for extreme violent activity. Others leave school to join terrorist cells and some in effect make terrorism their career choice, albeit often for careers cut short by imprisonment or death. It's not just deeply troubling, but definitional that many Palestinian universities have substantial student histories of student involvement in terrorism. Those perpetrators who were killed continue to the present day to be celebrated on campus as martyrs. And the book includes some color photographs of those celebrations. Um, the uh, copyright prohibits my sharing them with you uh, online. When suicide bombings began to fade as a strategy, the Intifada of course ended, Israel erected barriers to protect its citizens. Hamas shifted tactics to conventional bombings and began to organize student terror cells trained to build explosives to be set off in public places. Such cells continue to operate. In March, 2020, the Shin Bet security services erected, uh, arrested three Hamas members who were planning attacks at Teddy Soccer Stadium in Jerusalem and on IDF soldiers near Ramallah, though the stadium proved too well guarded to carry it out. These three men had met while studying at Birzai University. They were members of a student fraternity that's a center of Hamas activity. Israel security services identify, track, and arrest members of these student cells. Some have literally been caught with explosives in hand. The important thing to realize is that even though the security services have been good, very effective so far, at interdicting these projects, it's only going to take one terrorist success in our current environment 
to dramatically change relations between Israelis and Palestinians. The odds that they will not at some point be successful seem to me to be relatively small. In addition to maintaining bomb-making squads, both Hamas and Fatah train student groups to enforce their version of political and religious conformity on campuses. The rival groups, along with Islamic Jihad, openly recruit new members from each entering class of freshmen. The new students at Palestinian universities are given colorful brochures trying to encourage them to join Islamic Jihad or join Hamas, join the Fatah activist groups. They're recruited in the same way students are recruited uh, elsewhere in the world to attend particular campuses. And those recruitment brochures uh, celebrate the martyrs amongst their members. Neither faculty members or students feel free to express unpopular political opinions. A climate of fear regarding religion and politics prevails both on and off campus. There just is no academic freedom again regarding religion and politics. Despite the accusations readily advanced by BDS and its allies, Israelis again aren't the source of that climate of fear. It's the Palestinians themselves who have made ideological conformity a hallmark of their campuses. Israel has made, I think, some poor decisions, most notably staging raids on Palestinian campuses that accomplished little, in particular because most student terrorist cells do their actual organizing off campus, not on campus. But the omnipresent repression of political opinion is a Palestinian, not an Israeli project. The Palestinian Authority's hostility to freedom of the press enabled by 19, 2017 legislation contributes significantly to the enforcement of conformity on campus. It's as, Al as Amnesty International, no friend of Israel, and other international groups have testified, the only way to prevent running afoul of the incredibly va vague Palestinian Authority regulations against political offenses is to practice extreme self-censorship. You can't read the law and actually discover what you legally can and cannot do. It's a threat. And faculty members broadly feel compelled to resort to the self-censorship strategy. Decades long persecution, and in some cases murder of Palestinian accused, accused of collaboration, or more broadly of normalization of relations with Israel is a potent way to short circuit and condemn uh, peace initiatives. And there are Palestinian faculty who've had their lives threatened because of normalization, not collaboration. So there are at least two major reasons why the realities of Palestinian higher education are not well known. The first, clearly, uh, is the reality that contradicts the left orthodoxy that dominates humanities and social science disciplines in Western democracies. Palestinians have to be seen exclusively as victims, not as agents with a hand on their own destiny. Faculty members, and I think this is key, fear the reputational damage and social ostracization that can quickly follow upon breaching that left orthodoxy. Cowardice prevails. But it's also true that the facts contradicting this left orthodoxy have not been gathered together and made readily available. So that's partly what I've tried to do. Those two factors are, of course, mutually reinforcing, since fear of consequences discourages people from doing the requisite research. You're afraid of speaking out, you're afraid of doing the work, et cetera. Now, some of the research, especially that, needs, that needed to document pedagogical practices, requires attending classes at Palestinian universities. Not easy for anyone to do who openly identifies with Zionism. I'm not willing to take the chance. I have met with Palestinian faculty and talked with them, but to be a long-term presence on a campus, it, I wouldn't do it. There is some online information, it's limited. Mirzai University's Israel Studies program 
declares its mission, quote, to strengthen critical awareness of power, hegemony, and the moral philosophical aspects of knowledge production in confronting occupation, settler colonialism, and violence. That doesn't sound like a disinterested mission statement. A faculty member in the program is more explicit, quote, my basic strategy is to show them that all the atrocities of Zionism and the occupation are basically comparable atrocities. So it's reasonable to suspect that pressure for students to conform to such views is considerable and that academic freedom suffers in consequence. A couple of researchers dramatically have been able to audit classes at Islamic University of Gaza. Now, where every class is supposed to be taught from an Islamist perspective. I have no idea how you teach a physics class from an Islamist perspective, I can't guess. But in his 2009 book, The Political Ideology of Hamas, Michael Irving J Jensen of the Danish Institute for International Studies documents how a class in American literature handled Nathaniel Hawthorne's 1850 novel, The Scarlet Letter. Islam and Sharia law, the instructor explained, are much more ethical and humane than practices in the West. Instead of facing a lifetime of shame as a result of being forced to wear a scarlet A, uh, an adulteress um, in uh, Gaza would simply be stoned to death, a much kinder solution, or so he explained to his students. If I can call on a moment of personal privilege as a poetry scholar, I'll cite Jensen's account of a class discussion of British poet Roger McGuff's children's poem, The Cat's Protection League, from his 1997 book, Bad, Bad Cats, All Children's Poetry. Now, the constructor who taught the poem at IUG didn't tell the class who had written it or what its source was. And based on McGuff's collected poems, he's never written any poem about the Middle East. I don't know what he, if he's even interested in the topic. So I'm going to read the poem, whether you folks like poetry or not. Midnight, a knock at the door. Open it, better had. Three heavy cats, mean and bad. They offer protection. I ask, what for? The boss cat snarls, you know the score. Listen, man, and listen good. If you want to stay in this neighborhood, Sorry. If you want to stay in this neighborhood, pay your dues or the tomcats will call and wail each night on the backyard wall, mangle the flowers, and as for the dawn, a smelly minefield awaits on the lawn. These guys meant business without doubt. Three cans of tuna I handed them out. Then they disappeared like bats in hell those bad, bad cats from CPL. So the instructor begins by explaining that the language is colloquial. The professor, yes, it's dialect, everyday language, even though it's not in a friendly tone. It reminds us of American gangs, student, Jewish gangs. Professor, yes, just like during the Intifada, student, Jewish as usual. Student, it reminds me of Fagan and Oliver Twist student. I'll take a similar view. The cats symbolize the Jewish lobby in the States, and the man is an image of the United States. There's more, but the contortions necessary to read this totally innocent little poem through an anti-Semitic lens are remarkable, but it's clear what the instructor wants from his students. He's making it clear they're to give it an anti-Semitic interpretation. And they've been well trained. Indeed, IUG has a one year, a five year curriculum that includes Islamicum, a mandatory first year program that trains students in anti Semitic interpretation. We're faced with classrooms in Gaza that amount to hate groups. They're not classrooms, they're hate groups. What might we do in, what might we do in response? First of all, I find it unacceptable for European NGOs to provide grants to Islamic University on such an assumption that as a university, it's no different from one in Kansas or Paris. 
unrestricted grants to West Bank institutions are no more responsible. I do support student exchange programs as there's potential benefit from exposure to Western institutions. Academic freedom endorses the principle of intellectual exchanges with higher education systems, even when we find <clears throat> elements of them deplorable. Cutting off all contact is not likely to help matters, but uncritical financial support equates to endorsing values we really should reject. Birzeit declares that it supports academic freedom while asserting that those who support the occupation and Zionists in general should be barred from campus. I think administrators at Birzeit know better. They understand that they're falsifying academic freedom, but they proceed. A misguided trend in the West has been to treat Palestinian universities including on Nijab, Birzeit, and Islamic University as comparable to our own. Beleaguered, but still noble in intent, dedicated to an educational mission that we can and should support. Universities in the West in contact with these institutions should be pressing them to give genuine rather than hypocritical support to academic freedom. Both government entities and NGOs should do the same with the Palestinian Authority. Those who champion Palestinian academic freedom in the West, including accepting visiting appointments in the West Bank, should be pressed to acknowledge the realities. S groups that condemn Israeli prosecution of student terrorists should themselves be condemned for doing so. The evidence that BDS and other groups offer to prove Israeli suppression of Palestinian academic freedom often includes the campus in closures during the first intifada but those haven't recurred for 30 years. They're not part of the current environment, whereas the violence on these campuses perpetrated by Palestinians has morphed uh, into uh, away from suicide bombings, but it still continues 40 years later. A great deal of recent publicity surrounds supposed barriers to Western faculty taking up visiting appointments at West Bank universities. Unfortunately, a number of visiting faculty have chosen to teach on three month tourist visas rather than announce their intention to teach for the academic year and be granted the default academic year visa. And Israel has sought to enforce its five year limit on renewing visas, wishing like other countries to block the issuing of what amounts to default permanent residency on the West Bank. As far as the BDS law about the anti BDS law allowing its leaders to be barred from entering Israel, despite tons of ink on the matter, only one Western faculty member has been blocked from entering, US faculty member um, from Catherine Frankie from Columbia and her, uh, the, the uh, resolution barring her has since been reversed. So um, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to uh, much go into uh, the research process that's involved, I will say that um, it takes a huge amount of searches on academic databases and public databases to begin to locate the relative in information to compile this story. Um, there are no search terms that will get you a lot of it. Different search terms get you a little bit. You have to keep experimenting over and over again. There is one interesting helpful feature Journalists affiliated with Fatah will often report on uh, unsavory actions by those uh, committed to Hamas, and journalists committed to Hamas will often report uh, actions from those committed by Fatah. And once you have a bit of names and a bit of information, you can then confirm those stories from other sources. Um, you don't get any Hamas journalists reporting on both sides and the reverse from Fatah. You don't get you know, broad outreach beyond that. So um, why don't we shift to questions so that there's still uh, some time for that. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nelson for this interesting um, presentation. And we can move now into questions and answers and some discussion. Uh, I noticed, I'm noticing that um, Eddie Cohen 
uh, asked, um, I don't know if you have conducted um, research about academic freedom in other Arab countries. And, and what do you know, if you, if you compare academic freedom in the Palestinian territory, how would it compare with academic freedom in uh, other Arab countries? Well, I haven't done personal research, but there's quite a bit, there are quite a number of reports, very detailed reports available on academic freedom in other countries. Um, Egypt has had a long, uh, regrettable history um, under, its, under the previous Egyptian government, it was not unusual to have representatives of the police actually present in a classroom uh, surveilling what students and faculty members said. Um, so again, on the subjects of politics and religion, um, academic freedom is severely compromised in Egypt. Obviously, I, I can't imagine that any of you would think that academic freedom regarding politics and religion exists in Iran. It simply does not exist at all. And it, faculty members are expected to conform um, to prevailing state views. Under Erdogan uh, in Turkey, reasonable academic freedom did exist in Turkey uh, prior to Erdogan, but he basically crushed uh, the universities in Turkey. Uh, thousands of faculty members whose loyalties were suspect uh, were fired and universities uh, in Turkey, faculty members are expected to be mouthpieces for government policy. So once again, on the, in the key air, political areas, there simply is no academic freedom uh, in, in Turkey. Um, Lebanon's a more complex case where I think some academic freedom exists, but there's also a fair amount of coercion. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to deal with more countries than that, but you know, basic a little searching will find pretty detailed country by country reports on academic freedom elsewhere. I've done a lot of reading about those subjects, including reading sources uh, from those countries themselves, but I can't claim to have done original research. Uh, do you know of any uh, connections uh, between um, faculty members uh, in, in the West Bank and Gaza and Palestinian faculty members, say, in the United States and the West? Um, <clears throat> well, yes, there are, quite obviously. <coughs> Excuse me. Especially because faculty members in the U.S. have served as visiting faculty on the, in the, on the West Bank. You know, there have been a couple dozen of them over the years. And in many cases, those grow out of uh, email connections, the visits to the area, which then evolve into visiting appointments. And a lot of those people sustain their relationships. There are also some institutional relationships with West Bank universities. So Bard College has long maintained uh, a program at Al Quds University. Um, it's run into criticism from time to time, um, in part because Al Quds is itself a center of aggressive anti-Zionist activity. Um, and um, there's, um, uh, there's a campus in Hawaii that at the present time is trying to establish a relationship with Al Quds. Uh, there are a couple of courageous faculty members trying to oppose that new relationship with Al Quds. It's Hawaii at uh, Manoa, and I'm advising them and giving them some information uh, to help them try to prevent that kind of financially supportive relationship with Al Quds. But the BDS movement is incredibly strong in Hawaii. That's probably the state in the US where the BDS movement is strongest in part because of the strong identification with anti-colonialism that native Hawaiians naturally fear, feel. So uh, Hawaii appears to be a lost cause, but there are a lot of individual faculty relationships that are maintained. Uh, of course, um, uh, San Francisco State University, which has been a hive of anti-Semitic activity really for two full generations, uh, tried to sponsor 
uh, has sponsored uh, a series of relationships with Palestinian institutions. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we have with us uh, Professor Hillel Frisch, who is an expert on Palestinian affairs. Uh, would you like to make, uh, would you like to say a few things about the topic? Hillel? Great. Um, there are two avenues of research that um, could also sh uh, uh, shed light on um, academic freedom. One is to see if there's any collaboration between um, Palestinian academics, even on the personal level, with Israeli scholars. After all, Birzeit is either the best or the second best um, Palestinian university. Of, um, uh, possibly Gaza, Gaza competes with it, the Islamic University in Gaza. And they're one hour away from a world-class institution called the Hebrew University. Now, if there were academic freedom, I would assume naturally that some of the scholars would like to do collaborative work, not a, even on an institutional level, on, a, on an individual level. And yet you'll rarely find that kind of collaborative work, even in the most non-political aspects. For instance, in engineering, in, in the pure sciences. So that's one thing you could you could look at, and, and that would prove that would prove to what extent um, um, the article of faith uh, uh, against normalization between in, in Palestinian universities is absolutely is is an is a tenet of faith that no one no one defies. Um, the second the second avenue that you can explore is to look at the syllabus syllab syllabi of, of um, comparable courses at Hebrew, at Hebrew University in, let's say, on Palis the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and compare it to the Birzeit courses. I'm almost sure that in Birzeit, it's all, it all reflects one perspective. And um, in, in, in the Israeli universities, you'll find a more, a more balanced, uh, a more balanced uh, approach. The only um, the only exception to being willing to work together that I've found over the several years uh, amounts to relationships between Israelis and Palestinians that were actually formed in the 1980s right. uh, before matters became so intense. So, and they've actually been helpful to me in getting contact with Palestinians, so that faculty, so that I could then talk with them. On the other hand, when I met with a with a Palestinian faculty member from Gaza, it was by phone. Several people assured me that if he attempted to meet with me, he could pay with his life. So I felt it wasn't a good idea to promote that possibility. Um, there, but there are there are relationships with people that were created decades ago, and it's especially in the health area. Yes. Because when, uh, when uh, in it was in 1984, when Palestinians began to take uh, real uh, charge over their health system, that Israelis cooperated and helped them. There were some Palestinians at that point who studied in Israel. And some of those relationships still obtain, even if they don't often include face-to-face -face meetings anymore. Um, but new relationships being established in the last uh, 10 to 20 years, I can't, I can't find examples. Happily, some of the old folks are still around. You could, look at, you could look at Web of Science for collaborative, for collaborative um, research. Um, Web of Science, Google Scholar, and I, especially Web of Science. And I doubt if you'll find, a, a, you'll find any, I, again, not on an official institutional level even on a, on a, on a on private initiative. That's, that's one way of showing it. How could it be that a Beelzeit scholar who lives one hour away from Hebrew University, a world-class institution, wouldn't like to link up with a, with a scholar in, um, at, at, at Hebrew University? I mean, it would be natural, and yet it never happens. So that's, um, or very rarely happens. Yeah, I agree. Okay. 
Okay, there's another question here. What percent of Palestinian Arab students go abroad for university education? <clears throat> I actually, I, somewhere in my brain is that mathematical figure, um, but I can't recover it easily. Um, the, uh, if, you, if you want a PhD, <clears throat> you have to leave Gaza or the West Bank. You, you can't get it there. So anyone who wants uh, an advanced degree has to go elsewhere. And there are certainly many go to um, other Arab countries and many also go to Europe who can. Um, there are serious prohibitions against travel um, from Gaza especially. That's another area where Israel is blamed even though Hamas fails to issue travel permits. And Egypt, of course, blocks the Rafa crossing. It's been traditional for Palestinian students from Gaza who want to study abroad, do an exit through the Rafa crossing, uh, crossing in the south, and then fly from Cairo. But that's impossible as Egypt has largely closed the Rafa crossing. Um, so the, uh, the ability to go abroad has been curtailed uh, severely but there really is no other option sh except for master's degrees. You have to, you have to go abroad. And um, I think that should, that should be, arrangements should be made for that to be possible. Even if students have had a significant amount of anti-Zionist indoctrination uh, in Gaza or even on the West Bank, um, going abroad might have the potential to expose them to other cultures and other kinds and real academic freedom, and it might have an enlightening effect. So I think beyond just the human freedom issues or the human rights issues, I think that travel abroad should be restored to what its, its previous level was. Um, okay, uh... Some students from Gaza under very careful Israeli supervision probably should be able to study on the West Bank. But I think it should, they should be very carefully vetted. And I don't think the numbers at this point, point could be large because there's no, it would be foolish of Hamas not to insert uh, its terrorist allies into the body of students traveling to the West Bank. So uh, very thorough vetting should be necessary. But with it, I think some students should be given that freedom. Okay, uh, next, uh, Professor David Enoch wants to disagree with you, please. About Thank time, you. that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I thought that the hope was to show that Israel does not violate academic freedom or to respond to the worries about that. But as far as I can see, pretty much everything you did was an exercise of what about Israel. You've done nothing at all to show that Israel does not violate academic freedom. You've even conceded some what you call mistakes, I think, like storming campuses with no justifiable cause. Instead, what you did do was to divert attention to some other violations of academic freedom by Palestinians, some of them very real, very systematic, and very objectionable, some arguably anecdotal. How is this even remotely relevant to the question at hand? Also, and this goes to at least some of the anecdotal evidence you, you brought from what's going on on, on Palestinian campuses, we can probably tell rather similar stories about, say, what went on in Bar Ilan University during the month leading up to the Rabin assassination by a Bar Ilan student. And we can tell similar stories about other places and other times. Would you think about using that kind of story in order to justify violations of academic freedom at Bar Ilan University? <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I, let me deal with Bar Ilan later because I have <clears throat> visited there several times and. I've taught guest classes uh, at Bar Ilan, so I have some feeling for the campus. I have friends there. Um, the logic of this book, the project is first to raise the question, is Palestinian student and faculty academic freedom violated? Second, how is it violated? When is it violated? And who does the violating? So I track that very thoroughly. And it's Palestinian paramilitary groups, and it's the Palestinian Authority, et cetera, 
who are consistent and rigorous in violating the academic freedom of faculty and students in the West Bank and Gaza. There simply is no evidence of Israel doing the same. I try to point out the few things that Israel that I think does do uh, ill-advisedly. Um, and I've talked to Palestinian faculty about that, the raids on campuses. There should be raids, but they're better off. Most of them are conducted off campus and that's where they should be conducted because that's where students don't build bombs at Beer Zeit. They build bombs in, in towns and cities. So that's where those raids should be conducted. I mean, I think there, there simply, there are X number of actions that BDS allies and some Palestinians claim are actions by Israel that violate academic freedom. I go through each of those in the book in detail and show why that's really not the case. Certainly not the case over the last generation. I gave the examples of the campus closure, which obviously limits student access to, the, to the, you know, their universities and impact academic freedom, but that doesn't happen anymore. So I think the fact that there simply is no evidence and no credible claims of how Israel could be violating Palestinian academic freedom, that's the evidence. I mean, um, that's the evidence that's substantial. Israel's okay, not involved in the daily academic life of these institutions. Once the Palestinian Authority took charge of, of Palestinian education and specifically of higher education, it really became a PA responsibility. Um, day to day, Israel's not there. It doesn't supervise the curriculum. It no longer it wants to be, and then it is, including with Sorry. military forces. I couldn't hear what you were saying. Sorry, I said it's not there except when Israel wants to be there. And then it is with serious military forces, with severe restrictions on movement throughout the territory. And of course, with uh, involvement of security for of, of uh, uh, secretive security forces, there's plenty of evidence of all of that. I'm not justifying other violations of academic freedom, or indeed other violations of human rights by Hamas and sometimes by Fatah. But how is any of this supposed to make us feel any better about the violations Israel is responsible? Well, I think I think the the, the question that's relevant to Palestinian higher education is. What constrains free speech on these campuses? What prevents these campuses from being environments in which research results can be exp uh, explored freely and expressed freely? And it's not Israel that does that. So I think that the comp what, what constructs academic freedom on a campus and what structures it, that's the, prim that's the primary concern. I, you know, I advise against specific Israel activities that I think are completely counterproductive, but they're not a day-to-day -day influence on Palestinian campuses. Um, they don't create the environment. They're, they're, they tend to be time-specific, limited gestures um, rather than constitutive features of the educational environment. But there's some things Israel does that are ill-advised. No, quite no question about that. There are you know, I've met strongly uh, pro-Zionist Palestinian faculty who regret some of the things that Israel does. But, you know, when I talked to a dean at Al-Quds, also a faculty member, and said, are there any, are there any Palestinian universities that have a, a viable uh, academic freedom policy statement? He said, no, maybe you folks should encourage them to write one. Um, They've got to write it. Palestinians have to produce that environment. Israel can't do it for them and shouldn't do it for them. Can I just interject? I mean, the best proof of how little Israel influences is the universities is the students' politics and elections. All the, the election blocks are all affiliated to the factions. There's a Hamas, there's a Jihad Islami, and this has been the Jihad Islami, there's the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, pa the Popular Front for the pa Palestinian, <laughs> and this, this has been going on since Israeli occupa uh, occupation. 
all of the universities run these elections regularly and the fact and the blocks are completely affiliated to these to these factions much okay, more uh, piece of evidence oh, wait, wait, David, of uh, prisoners David. among students what david sorry wait what is that? Uh, we have what other people who want to no no yeah. no that's a good point what does he say i why well, wait, i don't well, know if wait, i'm wait, allowed wait. to speak at this point no, well, no, we no, have no, to move to him. we have to move to other issues please well, I do. Okay. I talk uh, a lot about the student elections, uh, especially on the West Bank in the book, um, because they have a long history and because they're the clearest expression of political opinion on campus. And the student councils uh, in West Bank universities have a lot more power than they do in Israel, Europe or the United States. They have they have a lot of authority on these campuses and and the, the university administrations uh, defer to the student council governments quite a bit. So those elections go beyond expressions of political opinion. Um, they really point to uh, the way uh, the campus environment is structured. So they're, they're quite important. Dr. Galen Segal, you have a good, uh, you have an interesting point to make, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you, we, yes we do. Okay, well, there's two points. One is how much of uh, the reading material in the English language is available in these universities, because first you have to read it to be socialized, to understand Western ideas, to actually use it. And the second one actually follows from that, and that is what we call the style of writing, that the style of writing in the Arabic language is far different from that of Israeli or in English or in Hebrew. So, for example, journalism in English and in Hebrew starts with the most important facts and moves to the background. In Arabic, many, many journalistic articles in newspapers are very flowery and don't actually state any facts. So to what extent, uh, both in terms of the reading of material at universities and the writing of material, articles and books and output, is so f entrenched in the language and the culture and the background that collaboration and freedom of speech and expression is uh, inhibited. In other words, the students and the academics have to become more westernized in their thought processes and their reading and writing to be what we would say an equitable level of how we could compare them. Well, what's your opinion? Professor um, so I, I will say that I, I am not well informed about the current state of Palestinian university libraries. Now, obviously, I haven't done any on-campus research. It helps to walk through the stacks of a library and see what's there, just to get a physical feeling for it. I haven't done that. There are, of course, reports on the state of their libraries uh, 30 years ago. Um, and um, there was at least at that time some reasonable representation of a variety of points of view even though the size of the libraries was very small uh, compared to Israel, Europe, or the United States, there was at least some diversity of opinion. Um, the current state, I don't really know. That would be useful to find out, I agree. Um, and I hope someone does some publishing on it. Um, uh, I haven't walked through Palestinian university libraries. I would be interested, but I haven't done it. Uh, and I don't think, not sure that I can. Um, in terms of the, the, the influence of um, long traditions of rhetoric in Arabic, I'm not sure. Uh, my interest has been in um, what one can find out about argumentative patterns. And I'm not, I'm not well informed either about um, you know, how much sort of flowery rhetoric uh, governs student writing. Uh, on the West Bank or Gaza, it's interesting. Okay, do, you, do you know yeah. of any? Okay, do you know of any Palestinian faculty teaching in Israel or vice versa? Some have studied. Obviously, there are Israeli Arabs, many of them teaching in Israeli universities. Some of whom probably identify as Palestinians, but I don't know of any West Bank faculty. Uh, teaching in Israeli universities. There may be a few, I just don't, I don't know of any. There are still some medical exchanges 
of students. Um, but I don't, and there are some West Bank faculty who have uh, interned in Israeli programs. Um, whether they have done a little bit of teaching as part of their intern relationships, I don't know. I've tracked some of the intern uh, presence in Israel, Palestinian intern presence in Israeli universities. And some interns do a little bit of teaching, but I'm, I'm not, I haven't seen any information about that. I want to ask you about relations uh, inside uh, the campuses of Palestinian universities. So we have usually we have students, uh, we have uh, faculty and administration. Uh, we have heard during the discussion a lot about um, politicized politics, uh, student politics, uh, faculty politics, perhaps. So who, who is ruling Palestinian universities? Uh, are the students ruling or the administration is ruling? What do you, what you can say about those web uh, of relationship? Um, well, first of all, student activism can dislodge a campus from doing what it's doing uh, in the West Bank quite easily. Uh, students, when the students get exercised about something, the administration will kowtow to them. Uh, during the first intifada, when Israelis were closing down universities, there were also protests on the campuses by students that led the Palestinian universities to close themselves down for less, for you know, a couple of weeks, sometimes a month. Um, the only way that they felt they could deal with student protest against institutional policies was to close down the campuses as well. So you have to begin with the knowledge that the student council groups, the elected groups, are extremely powerful in very practical ways on these campuses. And of course, they schedule pro-Hamas demonstrations, pro-Hamas exhibits, uh, astonishing. I'm sure you've seen publicity about the pro-Hamas exhibitions that include celebrations of violence. I, I include photographs of them in the book so that they, so that they are quite real for people. Um, faculty have a role in Palestinian university administration, but Palestinian universities as a rule are more hierarchical than what we're accustomed to in the West. And the regulations that govern faculty activities and prohibit varieties of activities are much more elaborate. And those regulations are established by administrators. I mean, there are people who say that, you know, you're not supposed to be able to take a breath on a Palestinian campus without some regulation impinging on your freedom and your rights. They're, they're heavily articulated campuses in terms of regulatory power. Those regulations are set by administrators. And I think we're really not accustomed to a comparable um, sort of judicial environment on campus. Administrators have a lot of power. The, um, Palestinian universities, <clears throat> and this is a really unfortunate fact, do not have a history also of establishing boards of trustees that are even national in scope, let alone international. The, the tradition in Palestinian universities is that boards of trustees are composed of local people. And so even the, admin, the level of uh, administration above the administration from the board itself tends to be pervaded by local and often uh, parochial interests. So local businessmen, local religious leaders tend to have uh, uh, the memberships on the board of trustees, the board of governors. That doesn't help academic freedom either. Um, I mean, so they're often the comfort with limitations on academic freedom within the boards of Palestinian universities, it's very high. They have no problem with it. Um, and you know the, the sort of uh, patriarchal, hierarchical elements in the Palestinian public sphere therefore have a lot of impact on the campuses because the, the, the sense that campus governance is separate from the local community is, not, is very weak. 
uh, it's, it's deeply connected. And it would be better if their boards of trustees were at least national boards within say the West Bank, uh, because you'd at least get some cultural diversity if they were truly national boards rather than having being local ones. That pattern was established decades ago and they haven't really overcome it. Um, and it's certainly very regrettable. Uh, I have another question about, um, there was a Palestinian students who go abroad to do a PhD. It seems that many of them stay abroad and don't come back. Uh, uh, I've done research about academic, international academic exchanges. The basic assumption is that when you go to study in a foreign country, you are influenced by the, by the by politics, culture, uh, norms uh, of that country. Now, those who are educated in the West in general, when they come back to work and teach uh, in Palestinian universities, do you see any of those uh, expected influences from the stay and study in the West? Well, if you look at the if you look at the the uh, vitas of Palestinian university faculty, you discover that those that have advanced degrees obviously got them in the West. They, other than master's degrees, they can't get them in the West Bank or Gaza. Um, historically, there have been a lower percentage of Palestinian faculty with PhDs, but over the last 20 years, that percentage has increased. There are more Palestinian faculty with advanced degrees. I can't remember the actual percentages, but it's, 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 I think it's acceptable now in a way that it wasn't in the 80s and the 90s. However, <laughs> don't expect a single one of those faculty members uh, to express unacceptable political or religious opinions without facing consequences. So my guess is that some do come back with contrary attitudes, with attitudes that have been shaped by the West, because I can come up with a few examples where Palestinian faculty members have spoken out, um, but they face consequences of the most serious order. Um, so some obviously go have time in the West and don't have their ideologies affected. Others, I think, do have acquire a broader sense of political understanding, but the campuses do not give an environment um, in which that can be expressed. So um, not as much has been gained uh, as we might hope from those How exchanges. Who is accrediting uh, degrees in the Palestinian territory? Um, well, Israel actually has a role in accrediting degrees if they're going to be recognized in Israel proper. So that's part of what goes on. But there are Palestinian accrediting entities that do, those, do that work as well. And I think you'll find that the, um, the European Union tends to recognize some Palestinian degrees as well. But mind you, they're not recognizing research degrees because they don't exist. I mean, the, the, the PhDs don't exist. So, you know, they're recognizing master's degrees, um, which is just a much less rigorous process, I think, um, than the recognition of doctorates. Okay, we are coming to the end of uh, this event. Uh, would you like to summarize uh, the presentation and the discussion? Um, well, the discussion's been great. It's really interesting to, um, uh, and I, I love being uh, criticized and challenged as well. There's just, it's no fun if you're not challenged at all. Um, even though I probably won't faint in fear at the fact, uh, I still like it to happen. And I'm happy to continue um, you can share my email address and I'm happy, happy to continue a dialogue with anybody who's interested um, to take any new questions, to get, to get information from people. Uh, I hope that we can, that some of us can continue talking after this. I mean, you know, here I'm isolated in my house with the COVID infection going wild. So I could use some human contacts from across the ocean. Um, so with that preface, let me say that I think 
a lot of the research that needs to be done about Palestinian higher education needs to be done by Palestinians themselves. There used to be more of that in the 70s and 80s than there is now. Uh, honest evaluations of Palestinian higher education from amongst Palestinians are pretty few and far between. But I think knowledge about Palestinian higher education is important, especially if claims about it help in the West to propagandize students and faculty and turn them into fervid anti-Zionists. It's a it, Palestinian higher education, representations of Palestinian higher education are a weapon in Western countries and therefore they matter to Israel. Um, and I think simply knee jerk affirmation of pa Palestinian higher education, which comes from the BDS movement here is no good service to Palestinian students. Just publicizing claims that education is great in Gaza and the West Bank doesn't really help education in Gaza and the West Bank. So I think you know, those of us who are interested should work to disseminate knowledge about the realities. Uh, it's, it's an important part of the political discourse about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I really appreciate Bez's opportunity um, to let me talk about it um, for an hour or so. Okay, one, more, uh, one last question. You, you write a book every year. What is going to be your next book? Um, well, I am writing some more essays about this kind of subject matter, but I'm also taking up a topic that I have resisted for a long time, um, A, because it's very painful and because I have felt I have felt bad about distributing the information that I have. Uh, and that's the, I'm calling the project The Poetry of Hate. Um, the first publications that I have are about actually Third Reich poetry. It's not very well known that especially not only in Germany and in the occupied countries during World War II, but especially uh, dramatically in the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa, uh, the Wehrmacht and the SS commissioned anti-Semitic poems and distributed them widely as part of um, building support uh, for the murder of Jews. No one's written about this. The Holocaust Museum in the US doesn't have those documents. I've built up relations with dealers in Europe and the Soviet Union. I have the original documents and I'm starting to issue them and write about them. But I'm also going to cover other forms of hate poetry, anti-Black poetry in the United States, anti-Catholic poetry in the United States uh, and in other countries. So I, I want people to see that Poetry has not always been the wonderful phenomenon and the ideal phenomenon that people think it's to be. So that's, that's a project I'm taking up that um, uh, it's not a lot of fun, but then writing about BDS isn't that much fun either. I, I've been spending some time on the dark side. Okay, how, how one gets uh, your, this, re this recent book of yours, uh, not in Kansas anymore, Academic Freedom in Palestinian Universities? Who um, published it? Well, Amazon and other online de uh, dealers will have it. They now have it. It just takes them a long time to kind of get it online. Uh, they may get it online by January 19th, if not by January 26th. I don't know how, how you get Amazon Israel to carry books. Um, I've never tried and I don't know how to do it. Obviously, I would like that to happen. That would be, that would be the best thing to happen. Um, Anyone who has any advice about how to get Amazon Israel to do anything, um, let me know and I'll do anything that I can from this end. Okay, Professor Kerry Nelson, thank you very much for uh, being with us uh, today. Uh, uh, this was a very interesting intellectual exercise and we all of you on behalf of the audience, uh, we thank you and we wish you health and a very good year, productive year for you and your family. Thank, thank you very you. much. Stay safe. Bye-bye.
Bye.